we have Anne-Marie Bagnall um, talking to us about qualitative research and what this can add to systematic reviews. Anne-Marie is a professor of Health and Wellbeing Evidence and Director of the Centre for Health Promotion Research at Leeds Beckett University. She has over 20 years of expertise in ed evidence synthesis methodology and has developed guidance on synthesis of qualitative research and practice-based evidence, as well as delivery training for Cochrane UK. Um, so welcome, Anne-Marie. Hey, Becky. Hi, everyone. So I'll take it away. Please do. <laughs> Thanks. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm a, before we get going, I just wanted to say I'm a relatively recent convert to qualitative research. Um, I came from a background of clinical trials and um, very, very quantitative research. And this has sort of gradually snuck in. Uh, so I really appreciate the, uh, the value of qualitative research and how it can complement the, the other kinds of research that, that we're more used to in the medical world. So this is where I can move on to the next. Oh, what have I just done? There we go. This is the uh, this is what we're going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about in this webinar. First of all, we're going to talk about what qualitative research is and what it isn't. And then what can it tell us? And then the so what question, which I'm sure you'll all be asking, how does this help me? And what on earth about the evidence hierarchy? What's the point of qualitative research? How can we include qualitative research in systematic reviews? What about risk of bias and strength of evidence? And then a couple of examples of systematic reviews where qualitative research has been really interesting as part of those reviews. So section one, what's qualitative research? So to start us off, I wondered if you would like to take part in this poll on Slido again. So if you've got that, um, you can scan in the QR code or if you've still got it up on your phones or computers, would you like to tick all of these that you think are qualitative research? And I will give you a clue. Um, there is more than one correct answer. So I'll just wait and see. And a few of you have voted. So your options are market research, semi-structured interviews, questionnaires and surveys, anecdotes, ethnography, case reports, and in-depth case studies. So I think that might be everyone who's voted. So let's see what the scores on the doors are. Great. Well done, everyone. So semi-structured interviews are the top scoring answer, and that is correct, yes. Um, Semi-structured interviews are a method of data collection um, in qualitative research. Questionnaires and surveys, yes, um, that's the wrong answer, 81% of you. Um, questionnaires and surveys are usually, no, you don't have to change your answer, whoever's voting now. Oh, we've got a few more coming in. Questionnaires and surveys are usually quantitative. They're usually, we're answering a question, but that's usually converted to a number um, when we do the analysis. Um, and it's very sort of very specific. I thought the same as you before I started working at Leeds Beckett and doing qualitative research. I also thought that questionnaires and surveys were qualitative research. So there is no judgment here from me. Um, don't worry about that at all. But that's why I put that in. And I'm pleased to see that you thought the same as what I used to think. Um, so I am talking to the audience I thought I was talking to. In-depth case studies, yes, that's right, 56% of you. In-depth case studies are a very detailed method of research. They can be, they can include quantitative data as well, because they can be um, picking up monitoring data, routinely collected data um, for a particular, whatever we're studying in our case study, a particular organisation or um, intervention, um, as well as the detailed qualitative. So not purely qualitative always, but they, there is a lot of qualitative in there. Market research, 
that's a bit of a trick question because it's not really research as far as I'm concerned, market research. It's not academic research. Um, but yes, they do ask qualitative questions. So I'll give you that. Ethnography, yes, that is a very detailed method of qualitative research where you actually sort of live as part of a, the community that you're studying or, you know, as part of, you know, take part in the organisation that you're studying. So not much of that around, but it's very interesting. Anecdotes, yeah, no, they're not research. They're not qualitative research, but a lot of people, when you think of qualitative research, think that's all it is. It's just stories. Um, case reports, yeah, no, again, that case reports are kind of on a level with our anecdotes, although I know they're useful, but so are anecdotes, um, but they're not, neither of them are really researched. They're just sort of sharing interesting findings. And it's the discussion that comes from those that I think is, is the learning point. And I've got my, uh, my lecturing head on there, uh, with the value we can get from things. I did see a question flash up about surveys, um, but I think, am I good? I'll, I'll answer it now. Um, something about free text. If a survey has a free text box, is it still, quite, still not qualitative? It's not ideal, really, to collect qualitative data that way. Um, if you get really detailed responses in those free text boxes, then it, you could do a qualitative analysis of, of that data. But what we usually get is very short responses in those boxes. And then there's not really much we can do with those. You, you end up just sort of coding them and, and counting them really saying, you know, this many people said, you know, think something along these lines. And this many people, yeah, this many people said, oh, I don't like it because it makes me itchy. And this many people said, I, I, I don't take it because it doesn't taste nice. You, you know, so sort of, we can, we can sort of code things, but it doesn't really give us that in-depth information that we prefer to get from qualitative studies. But I can pick that up later as well if, if we need to. So here's um, some detail about qualitative research design. So it's not, it's not just stories, it, is, it does have a design. The trouble with describing qualitative research design is that it's described as unstructured, diffuse, iterative. So rather than having a protocol, we, I do have a protocol for my qualitative research, but rather than having something that won't change, um, like a trial protocol or a systematic review protocol that we don't like to change, it's built into qualitative research that we may revisit, particularly the sampling. You know, if we feel we've not got the right people, or we've not got all the people, or the data that we've got from the people who are already in the study indicates that there's another group of people we might want to interview, then it's, it's iterative. We, we can change that, we can add that into the protocol, and that's okay in qualitative research. Sampling, for randomised controlled trials, you want a representative sample of the population, as I'm sure you know, but for qualitative research, we don't want that. We want what we call a purposive sample usually, although there are other sampling um, designs. But we usually, we, we have to think about whose perspective do we need to give us the answers that we're looking for here. So for example, if we were looking at something, if our research was looking at the experiences of adolescents going through the, um, the transition from pediatric to adult services for diabetes, for example, we don't want a representative sample of the, um, the adolescent population in a certain area or even the adolescent population with diabetes. What we want is particular people who have been through that transition and often their parents and carers and the healthcare professionals who are dealing with them as well. Okay, so it's different in that way from quantitative research. Data collection, there are lots of different ways, some of which were on that voting slide before. So case studies, which I've explained what they are, interviews and focus groups. And there are different ways of running those, but they all involve um, quite a lot of thinking about beforehand, um, schedules, interview schedules, prompts, which can be deviated from. Um, some interviews are, are more sort of open, but the default is usually these semi-structured interviews observations um, 
which is self-explanatory, <laughs> so watch what people do. Um, ethnography is a very sort of in-depth kind of observation. We can use creative methods to collect data for qualitative research, which is fun. And there are visual methods like um, photo elicitation, photo voice, and video um, participatory videoing, which is really uh, fun, and arts as well. So we can do things like um, mapping and storylines and storyboards of people's experiences, which is particularly good if you're talking to people who are very vulnerable, who've had some very difficult experiences that, they, you know, then you're not sort of, you can avoid eye contact and sometimes people, it's easier for people to talk then. So participatory mapping again and, and networks. So this is things like, um, you know, what's in my area? Where do I go? What's the pathway from services from, you know, maybe from pediatric to adult services? Um, what are my social networks? Who do I come into contact with? There's, all, there's a, a, a wide range of data collection, but not such a wide range of study designs. There are lots of different kinds of ways of analyzing the data. Um, and there are some that you might have heard of. There's grounded theory, which I've never used. That's the most, um, the most open kind of analysis. Um, interpretive phenomenological analysis, which again, I've not really used, um, but it's, it's a little bit more open than the kind that we often use is thematic analysis. And then framework analysis, which is more structured. So I'm not going to teach you how to do those things. It's just to give you the idea that they're, that it's more than just stories, it's more than just anecdotes. So what can qualitative research tell us? Quite a lot, okay. Um, in terms of the sort of theory behind it, it's, it's about meanings rather than measurements. That's how it differs from quantitative research. It's about understanding situations, experiences or beliefs rather than measuring them. Another sort of big leap that we have to make with qualitative research is there's no single answer. There's no one reality or one truth, which is the opposite of, of how we're used to thinking about trials. It's what we call inductive rather than deductive. That's what trials are. So people experience the same thing in multiple ways. There are multiple realities and truths depending on who you are and where you're standing. OK, which we cannot say that about, you know, drug effectiveness trials, but we can say that about our experiences of the social care system, for example. Context in a, in a randomised controlled trial could be a confounding factor, but in qualitative research, it's an important contributor, an explanatory contributor to, to what the person is experiencing. People and situations are observed and questioned. We try to ask open questions and not lead them because we need to know how, you know, what their experience is. And, and that's quite a skill is um, avoiding those kind of leading questions. Results are usually expressed in words or pictures. So you might have a photo exhibition or a storyboard, um, which, which can be used um, for the person's, the, the, or the group's benefit as well as for the researcher's benefit, which is always nice. So the sort of questions that we might ask as a complement to quantitative research in intervention studies are things like, you know, we're trying to find out if it works, but we also might like to know how does it work? Why does it work or not work? What do people think about it? How do people feel about it? Or how do a certain group of people feel about it? What do people believe about it? What do a certain group of people believe about it? And this is particularly relevant at the moment in terms of, um, or re relatively recently in terms of vaccine uptake and vaccine hesitancy. We've been asking these kinds of questions. Why won't people use this intervention or why won't some people use this intervention? Who is it actually suitable for? And what would help it to be implemented? What would make people more likely to use it or make it easier for it to be used? Other questions in, in different kinds of studies, so moving away from the intervention study, we might want to ask, what's it like to live with this condition, be it diabetes, asthma, um, a mental health condition, which is schizophrenia, something like that. How does it make people feel? How does it affect people's day-to-day -day lives? 
And again, we could ask quantitative questions about that, multiple choice questions, but an important thing about qualitative research is it sometimes gives us answers that we hadn't anticipated and we couldn't have anticipated because we're not living that person's reality. So we might not know what it's like to live with schizophrenia. So sometimes it's best to keep that open and ask that person, how does it affect people's relationships? How does society respond to people with this condition? Or how do I perceive that society responds to me with this condition? How do healthcare professionals respond to people with this condition? We could ask the healthcare professionals themselves. We could ask the people with the condition. Best qualitative research would ask both. What's it like to care for someone with this condition? What's it like to navigate the health and social care system with this condition? Again, that could be the person with the condition or the carer or both. What could be better? How could it be better? So these are our sort of, from these we build our um, recommendations sometimes for practice or for further research. So you might be asking, so what? How does this help me as, um, as a doctor or a, a clinical person? And what about the evidence hierarchy that we just saw um, that they were right at the bottom? Well, I've got some answers. You might recognize this fellow, um, David Sackett, the father of evidence-based medicine. Um, he mentions where this comes into it. He says, evidence-based medicine, conscientious, explicit, judicious use of current best evidence, that's our reviews, in making decisions about the care of individual patients. It means integrating individual clinical expertise, that's your expertise, with the best available external clinical evidence, that's the reviews, from systematic research. But if you look at his diagram, patient preferences are in there as well. Okay, so it's um, how do we get those patient preferences? The best ways to ask people. And as we've seen in the pyramid of evidence, it's the same pyramid, this is just not as good a diagram. They're down here. Qualitative studies are down here with um, uh, process evaluations and case studies and case series. But I think the case studies in here are not the kind of case studies that I was talking about. They're more like case reports. This is something that I stole from a colleague, um, Professor Ruth Garside of Twitter, an alternative evidence hierarchy. And it just sort of puts, it's basically saying there's no hierarchy. It all depends on using the right study design for the question that we're asking. So if qualitative research can tell us things about, you know, why, why don't people use this medicine? What's it like for people taking this medicine? Why don't people take it? Why do people take it? Rather than the questions about, does it work? Okay, so they can complement each other. There's also an argument about health inequalities and how most interventions have the potential to increase the health gap. Okay, and qualitative research can be one way of getting evidence from people who don't generally take part in randomized controlled trials. It's a bit of a weaker argument, it's a different argument. Um, it's just the argument is just that rather than saying we have no evidence, we might have a little bit of evidence that we can then use to, um, to focus uh, further research. Okay, but I'm going to skip over that bit because there's, I need to talk to you about this. How can qualitative research be included in systematic reviews? First thing I wanted to say is that narrative synthesis is not the same as qualitative synthesis, okay? Um, narrative synthesis just means, and narrative synthesis is part of any systematic review, whether we've got quantitative studies, qualitative studies, or a mixture, um, it is just a way of organizing our results, okay? But we can use narrative synthesis to bring together the results of a review that includes qualitative evidence. So this is just a slide going into a little bit more detail with some links in about, <coughs> excuse me, about what narrative synthesis is. Okay, and it is just a textual thing, but we use tables and we group things um, as part of the review, okay. There's also, there's a link in there that's um, for those of you 
who are doing narrative synthesis of quantitative evidence, um, which is a little bit by the by, but I thought you might like to have it. This is there's a general framework for narrative synthesis, uh, that, which usually involves a theory or rationale for how the intervention works, which is in your background in your in, in a systematic review, um, developing a preliminary synthesis of findings, exploring relationships and patterns in the data, and assessing the robustness of that synthesis. So you know the strength of the evidence. Um, that applies to whether it's quantitative or qualitative evidence. Qualitative synthesis, I'm not going to explain what all these different methods are, it's just to illustrate that there are lots of different ways of doing it. And we can only do this if, if all our evidence is qualitative, okay, and, it, and it's not the same as narrative synthesis, but it could be a more detailed part of our synthesis. So we've got these Metaethnography is if we have ethnographic studies that have a lot of um, rich, what we call thick detail in them. There's grounded theory, which I've never used that. Um, thematic synthesis is the one that I generally use in my work. It's quite straightforward. And I've got an example of it to show you in a moment. And, um, and framework synthesis is, a, is an even simpler way of doing things where we, we sort of tabulate the data with quotes and things. The others I'm not going to go into, um, but if anyone wants more information, there is a reference there that goes through all those different kinds of ways of doing qualitative synthesis. You can also do mixed method synthesis which is a way of combining the findings from quantitative studies with the findings from qualitative studies within the same review, okay? And that's assuming that your review is a review that, that's appropriate to ask um, questions that can be answered by both quantitative and qualitative evidence. We often see it um, randomized controlled trials with associated process evaluations. So that's about how effective is this treatment and how can we implement it successfully so that it is delivered, it's, it lives up to its potential effectiveness. Okay, so that's the most common kind that you'll come across in clinical practice. In terms of mixed method synthesis, there are different ways of doing it again, but the two most common are sequential and convergent. So I'm going to show you an example of a sequential mixed method synthesis. And all that means is we either do the meta-analysis first and then use the qualitative synthesis to try and explain any strange things or unusual things in the findings, um, or we do the qualitative synthesis first and then use that to ask further questions that we that we look so we look at different things in the meta-analysis we, we look at different factors and see if things vary according to these factors that the qualitative synthesis is telling us might have an influence convergent is where we just do them both completely separately and then pull them together in our narrative synthesis so um we've got some findings from quantitative studies we've got some findings from qualitative studies and we, when we we just write them up together in the same section, which is quite straightforward to do. What about risk of bias and strength of evidence? Yes, we do, we do do validity assessment and we do look at the strength of evidence for qualitative studies. Okay, there's not generally an agreed validity assessment checklist for qualitative studies. And that's partly because there's some debate over whether it should be done at all. The purest of qualitative researchers think that taking things out of context and putting them into a systematic review um, is a bad thing to do and you should never do it with qualitative studies. Obviously, I don't agree. Um, and, I, and lots of people don't. There are lots of systematic reviewers um, who do qualitative um, reviews. So I think you know, if you're including qualitative research in a review, you've already made the decision you're going to assess its validity. It's not about bias, okay? Because we are in qualitative research, we're looking for a bias sample, we're looking for a bias viewpoint because we're looking for, at particular groups of people's viewpoints. And it's not about external validity and how generalizable our results are. It's about how credible it is and how, um, 
how repeatable it is in that particular group if, if someone else asking the questions would get similar answers. So the credibility is more subjective than it is when we're assessing risk of bias. Transferability, to assess that, we need the study to have given a detailed description of the context. Dependability, that's about um, can it um, can, can, can we see change here? Is it capable of documenting change? So there's some similarities there with the quantitative risk of bias. And confirmability, and that's about you don't, it's not good practice to have just one person, one researcher analyzing the data in a qualitative study. Usually um, to, to get good, good marks on confirmability, you have to have another researcher or, or more um, looking at that data as well. There is a CASP checklist um, for qualitative studies, and really that's probably got everything on it that you need. We've looked at different checklists for validity of qualitative studies, but um, this one, uh, we, 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 most of us agree that this, this one is fine. Um, it's got everything that you need on there. You don't need to look at the others. Strength of evidence. We were talking about, um, Katie and Martin were talking about grades um, and the summary of findings tables. There's a similar process for qualitative evidence, but obviously using slightly different criteria and it's called grade circle, confidence in the evidence from reviews of qualitative research. So it's been developed by a group of um, people who are very good at um, and this sort of methodology. They're part of the grade guideline development group um, and there's a link to, to that there. And I have used it, it is relatively easy to use. So here's some examples. I've got two examples of systematic reviews that partly or wholly based on qualitative evidence. The first is a mixed method review from the Institute of Education at UCL from a while ago. It was quite a famous one, children and healthy eating. So what this review was looking at, this systematic review, barriers and facilitators of children's consumption of fruit and vegetables. It was a sequential mixed methods review. So the first thing they did was a meta-analysis to pull the effect sizes from outcome evaluations, randomized controlled trials, actually. Um, and then they did a qualitative analysis from some other studies to synthesize findings of children's views about fruit and vegetables. And they were particularly, they were looking at the barriers and facilitators. So what, what would encourage you to eat more fruit and vegetable and what puts you off eating more fruit and vegetables? And then there was a cross-study synthesis to integrate the findings where they, they took the children's views and then they looked again at the meta-analysis and looked at in terms of subgroups of studies that met those criteria, called it a match. So appropriate interventions which match children's views led to a bigger effect size. So for example, children had said, if I'm told that fruit and vegetables are tasty, then I might eat them. Um, but if I'm told that they're healthy, that doesn't really encourage me to eat them. So they did a sort of subgroup analysis of the studies that were um, promoting fruit and vegetables as tasty rather than healthy and found that actually, yeah, there is a bigger improvement increase in the fruit and vegetables eaten in those studies. And also opportunities for children to influence the social context in which they eat. Those studies where children were involved in the design, I suppose, of how the fruit and vegetables were being given had a bigger effect size, a bigger increase in fruit and veg consumption. And very last slide, a purely qualitative review of um, weight loss maintenance, people's experiences of weight loss maintenance, a thematic synthesis of 26 studies, so quite a big review. Um, and this is what it found. I'm not going to go into the details of how it did it. Making behavior change generates a psychological tension. This was a psychological review um, due to the need to override existing, eat, ex existing eating habits. So, and that tension was due as to the incompatibility of the new behaviors with the fulfillment of psychological needs. So, how to get over that. Successful maintenance of weight involves management or resolution of this tension through management techniques, self-regulation, renewing of motivation to maintain that weight loss and managing external influences. So and that, that's things like, um, you know, not, not going for a takeaway or going for a walk instead of going out for a meal, that sort of thing. 
um, changing habits, this um, resolution of attention, changing habits, finding other ways to address needs. Okay, so going for a run instead of eating chocolate. In, in my case, that's that's one that I do try to. And then there the are lots of changing self-concepts, which I think was a bigger ask in this review. But that's um, that's useful um, in if you're somebody who's trying to develop an intervention to help people lose weight and maintain that weight loss. So that's the end of my presentation. And I can see there are some questions. And um, that was really interesting. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And yeah, it's the examples at the end, I think, are quite powerful to just demonstrate how your qualitative data has been able to kind of, I suppose, change what people took from those reviews and you know, can, you know, impacting decision. And it's just, you know, you look back and go, actually, it's quite simple, maybe matching what children <laughs> want to eat. But yeah, you may not have ever discovered that without you know, qualitative evidence. That was really interesting. Um, so, if, so for people, um, if you yeah, leave some, put questions in the Q&A, um, we've got a few from Mohammed, and I think some of them came Ooh. through halfway through the talk. So I think you might have mentioned about, or I hope you kind of answered already about the mixed methods and what to do with the, you know, the kind of quantitative and qualitative. Oh, part. yeah, there's, there's various ways of dealing with that. You, you could do it completely separately, Mohammed, or you can... Um, and just report them separately if you think the meta-analysis is answering a different question from the qualitative research or you can like in the healthy eating study use the qualitative to interrogate do some subgroup analysis in the um, in the meta-analysis if, if you can get a match between what the qualitative says and what some of the studies say Although that's not the, those aren't the only ways of doing it, but they're just examples. Yeah. And then another question from Mohammed was about advice on kind of specific courses for learning about more about qualitative research. Ah. The, I know that a Circwell do online training, the, the Circwell group, um, but that's more that's more about how to grade, how to use that in systematic reviews. Um, it's, there's there's lots of different courses for learning quali about qualitative research and and yeah we tend to use en vivo to analyze it but it depends what sort of <laughs> depth you're going into um yeah i i i would have a look around there's not there's not sort of one that i would recommend Mohammed. i think there's there's a lot of universities run courses on qualitative research i'll tell you um sage research methods the you know the journal sage they actually have um i'll try and find the link and send it through to becky so you can send it to people but they they actually have uh, a little section on, on their website that's open and they've got webinars as well about qualitative free oh i'm not sure if we've lost Anne marie or if it's my internet that's playing up we'll just give it a few moments um, whilst Amory's trying to get back on, I'll just have a look at um, some of the questions. I'm not qualitative research; it's not something I'm particularly up to speed with. Um, so, interesting question about the minimal important difference. We'll save that in case Amory reappears. And Mohammed, your questions on kind of selection of topic topics for research or you know protocol being published prior to systematic review is that specifically to qualitative or is that quantitative as well okay for both um so certainly for the for quantitative reviews you want the protocol to be published beforehand and one of the reasons for this is just so every, all the decisions are made a priori and you're not being influenced by the data that's coming out to try and avoid bias. Um, one of the other benefits of kind of publishing protocols beforehand is that it means other people can look at it and you can get feedback on the protocol. It might be that you've overlooked something um, and you know another researcher comes and looks at it and goes, yep, yeah, you could try this instead. Um, to try and make the review as kind of as good as useful as it can be. 
I'm not quite as up to speed with qualitative reviews and if that's different or not. Um, and I suppose for uh, Mohammed also asked a question about um, you know, selection of a topic um, or research question for a systematic review and what to do about it. Um, I think there's a few different kind of options available. So I'm you know, I'm just coming to um, hopefully publishing a protocol for review that I'm doing, and you know some of it is knowing what the you know what the evidence is already, what other reviews have been done in the area, and see if there's any gaps. Um, it's also quite useful to speak to leaders in the field about things that they think is important. Um, as we were kind of discussing last week, some people do kind of focus groups and involve you know patient or consumer participants in you know, asking them what are the things that you want to know about that we don't know about already and using that to kind of tailor questions and you know, trying to work out what are important questions to be asked that haven't been asked already. It's quite useful to, if you are thinking about doing a systematic reviews, looking on Prospero, um, because that has a list of all of the different reviews. Um, and you can see if things are already in the pipeline. Um, I've gone off piece slightly. And we were sorry, Becky, That's I don't right. know what happens. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Picking Q and A's that I could answer, um, but now you're back. Um, you questions... saved the hard ones for me. I have saved the difficult ones for you. Um, can you use qualitative research to help define a minimally important difference? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think you probably can. Yeah, I think um, it depends what obviously what your um, what your subject is, what what your minimally in clinically important difference is um in what <laughs> but but yeah i think by by talking to people you can get an idea of what what's meaningful to them so you could say okay your your pain has decreased this much but you know what what would really make a difference to you and if you you would need to ask more than one person but if if you have a, a panel of people and um, that I think, yeah, that has been used before and it's used in um, economic studies as well for valuing outcomes. So, yeah, I think it, I think it can be used. I can't say I can give you a specific example of where it has been used, but yeah. it's a really interesting question. Um, and another question that I partially answered was um, for kind of qualitative reviews are protocols produced in the same way as a quantitative review? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I heard you talking about Prospero as I uh, reappeared. So, um, yeah, yeah, we've we've put um, protocols for um, qualitative reviews on on Prospero and, and that's fine. Yeah, everything is exactly the same, uh, really, apart from you might be, you know, have, have different inclusion criteria around the S of the PICA or, or if you're really going, if it's not an intervention review, obviously you'd be using a different acronym than PICOs. But but all the all the bits, all the um, headings are the same, really, and and it's just the analysis that's different. But you should have just as much rigor in your protocol. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more minutes. If anybody else wants to add a few more questions to the Q and A, um, I suppose one of the things that I was wondering about is, you, know, you mentioned you initially were you're very much a quantitative researcher. Was there a particular thing that moved you on to qualitative or was there just a kind of slow development? I think it was really the very first study that I did um, at Leeds Beckett. Because the first thing that happened when I got there was I went to a seminar and someone was presenting their, um, their a study they'd done using photo voice. And I was completely horrified. I thought, well, this isn't research. You know, people in the community were going around taking pictures of things that meant something to them and then talking about them. And I think, well, like, well, what's that tell you? Like, what's that's not very generalizable. And I, because I hadn't really come across qualitative research before, uh, but then the first study I did was a mixed method study of um, self care in primary care and self care for people. It was an NHS study. Um, and one, it was two parts, two completely different studies, really. And one of it was about self care training, um, so kind of health promotion training for groups of people um, working in just 
in the community. So we chose parks and landscapes people because there's a lot of those around in, in West Yorkshire um, and they were given some training. And then we came in and we, we, we had a big questionnaire, big survey, but we also did a lot of in-depth longitudinal interviews with them. And you could really see, you know, the, the, the findings of the questionnaire, which showed small change in a large group of people, as it turned out. Um, the fans of the interview was showing sort of large change in uh, in smaller numbers of people, but really sort of giving you insights into how that worked, um, you know, and how those changes were made, and and you know that the progress that people had made through time it really brought it to life. And the same with the self care in primary care, which was aimed at um, primary care practitioners, mainly GPs, um, who were given some training, which I'm sure well it didn't go down very well, I don't think. Um, in how to deal with frequent attenders as they were referred to at the time um, to encourage people to manage their long-term conditions um, more effectively, better ways. Um, and we got a lot of interesting information from those interviews with primary care professionals, some of which was relevant to the research and some of which was just general offloading about um, working in primary care. But it was it was very interesting because it didn't work in primary care, but it was very clear why it didn't work from what people told us in those interviews. And that was very useful because otherwise we'd have just had it didn't work and no particular exp explanation of, of why it didn't work. But we knew absolutely why it didn't work. And, and that was not just from anecdotes that people had told us, but from these sort of series of interviews that we'd done. So, yeah, that was my light bulb for me. And then it's, um, I, I enjoy it as well. I love I mean, I have my recorder taken off me sometimes because I just let people talk. I love listening to what they say. <laughs> I mean, so it sounds like, you know, the qualitative can just really complement, I suppose, the quantitative research and, yeah, kind of asking why things don't work. Do you sometimes find that people kind of work in cycles? So they do, you know, maybe you know, qualitative, a bit of scoping, some quantitative, and then we'll go back and go, actually, why did this not work or why did it yeah. work and then kind of have a you know, go again on something quantitative yeah they go let's explore that a bit more and um yeah ask the questions and then then you could you've got the right focus for your quantitative research it can be expensive qualitative research because it's time consuming spending that time with people and then you know getting the interviews transcribed and analyzed but it's yeah it's it's worth it. And the other thing that we find, I said we, we get unexpected findings. Um, so questions that we didn't think to ask, uh, people will answer for us. Um, but we also, you'll often hear about negative things more in qualitative research. So people will share with you how much they hated this intervention that's done very well on the, on the um, questionnaires, for example. <laughs> and so you don't get that perspective from the surveys, but you, you, people tend to tell you about it qualitative and that's useful as well lovely fantastic so thank you very much Anne-Marie for your you. time it's been really interesting